24, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today has been a dynamic day. We've had some super singing, fantastic fellowship, powerful praying. Uh, Maria was baptized today. And you're back tonight, and for that we are grateful. Thank you for your presence. Dennis, raise your hand. Dennis. <laughs> Uh, an evangelist up uh, about an hour and a half from here. He's come tonight. We've had other guests in the audience. Uh, uh, in fact, I preached for, I spoke for Dennis's church uh, Wednesday night. I was in Tennessee, and, and I spoke on uh, Zoom, I guess it was. Uh, but uh, say it again. Okay, wh wh whatever it was. I was on the uh, computer back home and uh, I taught their Bible class from the state of Tennessee. But great to see Dennis. Great to see you. Have a marvelous crowd, and may God bless the study of this word. I want you to open your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 15. It's the third book of God's New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. There's the book, chapter 15. Tonight, we're going to be talking about revival in the home. In this morning's Bible class, God's recipe for revival, uh, the morning lesson, revive us again, uh, faith of God's people, the church, and tonight, revival in the home. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus speaks about a lost sheep, some lost silver, and a lost son. In Luke 15, verses 1 through 7, he speaks about a lost sheep. Verses 8, 9, and 10, some lost silver. And then in verses 11 through the remainder of the chapter, 11 through 32, he speaks about a lost son. Can you remember three S's? If you can remember, do you head like this? Sure you can. Well, if you can remember three simple S's, sheep, silver, Son, you have Luke 15 in your heart. You know what this chapter is all about. I wish that I had the time to talk to you about the sheep and the silver. I don't, for time's sake, only the son. We're going to start in Luke chapter 15 and verse 11. Are you with me? Verse 11 of Luke chapter 15. Jesus said, a certain man had two sons, my father. For many years he served as an elder of the church. He had two sons. I have an older brother by the name of Steve. Steve is also a preacher. I'm the youngest of the two kids. So I can identify, I can see myself in the story. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance on riotous, not righteous, but riotous, wild, extravagant, sinful living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a person, a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed pigs, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine that the pigs did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will rise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you, not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose, and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, O father, I've sinned against heaven, and in your sight I'm not worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and and shoes on his feet, and, and, and sir, bring hither the fatty calf, and kill it, and let us see to be merry, for this my son was dead, and is alive again, he was lost, and is found, and they began to be happy. And that's Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. Brothers and sisters, what do we usually call this story? We call it the story of the I want you to do me a favor. I want you to go back to Luke chapter 15 and find the verse in which Jesus refers to the kid as the 
TK, the prodigal kid, the prodigal son. When you find it, do this. Look over Luke 15, verses 11 through 24, and find the verse. We're looking for the verse in which Jesus refers to him as the prodigal son. Anybody found it? It's not in there, is it? Now you can read and read and read and study and study and study all day long, but it's not in there. Nowhere does Jesus say, hey, I want to tell you the story of the prodigal son, and yet that's the way that we know it. Luke 15 is mentioned in a sermon in a Bible class we say, let's see, Luke 15, Luke chapter 15, Luke, oh yeah, that's, uh, that's the story of the prodigal son. We call him a prodigal son, a sinful son, a rebellious son. I have one son, his name is Pete, I say Pete, don't embarrass daddy, don't turn out to be like this kid. He's not a good kid, he's a bad kid. But you know something? I can see some good in him. I say, brothers and sisters, I can see some good in the son of Luke chapter 15. I say, I can see some good in it. And let me share a couple of good things that I see. In the first place, he did not blame others. Number one, he did not blame others that he ended up in that pig pen. Sometimes we want to do that, right? We want to point fingers and blame other people. Let me ask you, have you ever run out of gas and kicked? The car, we do that, right? We want to blame the car because we're out of gas. We want to blame somebody else. That's what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Remember the story? God told Adam and Eve not to eat of a certain tree. If they did, they would surely die. The devil came along and said, wait, wait, wait a minute, God said you'll die, you'll not die. He added one word, just one, to the word of God. God said you'll die, you'll not die. God knows that if you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be open. You'll be as wise as he is. And they listened to the devil. And because they did, God wanted to know why. God went to Adam and God said, Adam, why did you do it? What did Adam say? Who, me? It's not my fault. Yeah, woman's fault. Usually is, isn't it, guys? It's what we men think, woman's fault. And you know, God's not prejudiced, so she, he goes over to Eve and God says, my daughter, why? Why did you do it? What did Eve say? Who, me? It's not my fault. It's, yeah, the devil's fault, right? The devil made me do it. Have you ever seen that T-shirt that says the devil made me do it? Well, it's not a new T-shirt in any sense of the imagination. It's as old as the Garden of Eden. That's what Eve said in the Garden. The devil made me do it. But see, that's one of the good things that I appreciate about the kid of Luke 15. When he came home, he didn't come home wearing that T-shirt. He didn't come home saying, oh, the devil made me do it. He didn't come home blaming his mama or his daddy or his older brother. He didn't come home saying, mama, dad, you know why I ran away? Let me tell you why. It's Joe's fault, my older brother. Get on to Joe. No, sir. He came home saying, who blew it? Who's to blame? Me, myself, and I. So number one, he did not blame others for his own mistakes, for his own failures, and that's something good that I see in him. Let me share another good thing that I see. In the second place, he did not beg. Number one, he did not blame others, and number two, he did not beg. He said, you know, I have two good hands, I have two good feet, I have a healthy body, and I'm able to go to work. Now, do you remember the kind of work he did in that far country? What did he do? Yeah, you, you can call it husking the swine if you want to. Yeah, swine. <laughs> that's what we say. In the, I'm not sure about California, but that's what we say in the South. We, we say he slopped the hog. And folks, there are a lot of things that I'd rather do than slop the pig. Preaching, Matt. Preaching, a little bit easier than slopping the hog. Uh, working at uh, Home Depot. A little bit easier than slopping the hog. Babysitting, ladies, is a little bit easier than slopping. See, that's one of the good things that I appreciate about the kid of Luke 15. He wasn't too good to slop the hog. He wasn't too good to get little stains on his hands, dirt under his fingernails, sweat on his face. He did not stand back and say, hey, where do I sign up? Excuse me, sir, what are you going to give to me? You see, the good book still says, 
I'll start and you finish, okay? I'll start and you finish. The Bible still says, if a man does not work, neither should he. Yeah, you know that verse, right? We like to eat. And if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. And I believe, that's 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10. And I believe that the kid of Luke 15 understood that. So he wasn't too good to go to work. Now the point is this. He's a bad son. He's a sinful son. We call him prodigal son. But I still see some good in him. And brethren, isn't that what we ought to be able to see in the lives of one another? The good instead of the bad? Isn't that what we ought to be able to see in the lives of our brothers and sisters in Jesus? The positive instead of the negative? Anybody else want to say amen? That was weak. <laughs> You know what? We don't say amen. That's what we look for. We look for what's wrong. We look for the negative. Some time ago, I went somewhere to preach, preached one of my best sermons, marched back to the back, started shaking the folks out, and there was a guy that walked out. He shook my hand, and he said, ah, I'll give you a D minus. He was serious. You ever made a D minus? I heard about a little boy that made a D minus. In fact, he made four F's and one D minus. And his daddy looked at the report card and said, Son, what in the world have you been doing? And the kid said, Well, Dad, I guess I've been spending too much time on that one subject. Four F's and one D minus. I think that's what the guy said. He, he was serious. He said, I, that sermon, I, I'll give you a D minus. And that's often what we look for. We look for the D minuses instead of the A pluses. We look to pick and pick and gripe and gripe and stomp and stomp. And we get on the phone and we gossip and we gossip. And let me tell you something, folks. If you look for the bad long enough, you're going to be able to find it. You know that? Regardless of how sweet a person he is, how innocent, he has warts, he has wrinkles, he makes mistakes, and there's bad in elders, and there's bad in deacons, and there's bad in preachers. But folks, I don't want you to see the bad. See, if you look for the bad in me, it's not going to take you long to find it. It really isn't. But I don't want you to see the bad. I want you to see the good. And husbands, you ought to see the good in your wife. Ladies, give him an elbow. Punch him in the ribs. Whisper in his ear, say amen or sleep on the couch. <laughs> There's a guy that doesn't want to sleep on the couch. Men, we need to see the good in our wives. And wives, you need to see the good in your husband. And parents, you need to see the good in these kiddos. And boys and girls, see the good in mom and dad. You say, Keith, this is a church and I've got my Bible. Give me some Bible. You want some Bible? Let me give you some Bible. Philippians 4 verse 8, Paul said, Whatever is true, honest, just, pure, lovely, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, Think on these things. What things? The good things, not the bad things. You want to grow this church? Let me tell you how to grow the church. Just go out into the community and brag on the good things that are going on here. Brag on the leadership, the elders, the deacons. Brag on your preacher. Just go out into the highways and hedges and brag on one another. And I promise this church will go up and up and up. He's a bad son, a sinful son. We called him prodigal son, but I still see some good in him. He did not blame others, and number two, he did not be. You say, well, Keith, why did we call him a prodigal son? Well, I believe that Jesus tells us right here in Luke 15. I want you to go back to verse 11. We'll just verse by verse. Luke 15 and verse 11. Jesus said, a certain man had two boys, and the younger of them said to his daddy, Daddy, Give me the goods that belong to me. You know his basic problem? Let me show you his basic problem. His basic problem was this. He went to his daddy with his hand out. Hey, Papa, take care of me. Give me what's coming. Hey, Daddy, don't forget about me. Here I am. Give me what's coming to me. His basic problem was that of selfishness. We all struggle with it. You don't believe me? Uh, I've got a camera in my hand. 
and I get over on this side of the room and I, I get your picture. You look at the picture. Who's the very first person you look for in the picture? Person sitting beside you? Behind you? In front of you? Oh, no. Where am I? Where am I? Oh, there I am. And if you look good, boy, this is a good picture. And if you look bad, what's wrong with your camera? We all struggle with this thing called selfishness. Have you ever noticed how selfish little babies are? They, 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 I mean, they're just selfish. Now, we have some little boys and girls in this audience. But kids can be selfish. They really can. Hey, mama. Hey, daddy. Take care of me. Give me what's coming to me. We all struggle with this thing called selfishness. Me, myself, and I. I think about what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. He said, This know also in the last days troublesome or perilous times shall come. Brothers and sisters, do you realize we're living in the last days? We really are. You say, Keith, how do you know that? The Bible tells me so. He said, In the last days perilous times will come. What are you talking about, Paul? Men will be lovers of their own selves. They'll be lovers of their own selves. Now he goes on to say, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, but did you notice the very first sin on the list? The very first sin. Selfishness. You know why there are so many divorces in America? Selfishness. You know why there's so much greed among us? Selfishness. You know why there are so many sexual immoralities among us? I want to please me, myself, and I. I want to do my own thing. I want to have a lot of fun. Give me what's coming to me. We all struggle with this thing called selfishness. Is your home in trouble? Are you fussing and fighting at home? Do you have to have it your way? My way or the highway? We all struggle with this thing called selfishness. And that's what I see in Luke 15. He goes to his father like this. Hey, Papa, don't forget about me. Give me what's coming to me. But I see something else here. Let me share it with you. I see this word. I see the word sin. Sin. Look to Luke chapter 15 and verse 13. Verse 13. He goes to his daddy with his hand out. And so the father divides his living. And then verse 13 says, Not many days after, the youngest son gathered all together and took his journey to a far country. You know what he does? He runs away from home. You ever wanted to run away from home? I remember when I was a kid, I, I wanted to run away from home. I, I remember when I was a little boy, I, I was fussing and fighting with my mom, uh, fussing with my mama, and, and, and my daddy got involved in the, in the conversation. I got so, I'm not proud of this. I'm not proud of this, but I got so mad at my daddy you know what I did? I pulled out my BB gun. I was angry at my daddy, so I was going to I was going to get my daddy. So I got out my BB. You know what my daddy did? He got out his BB gun. But his BB gun did not look like my BB gun. His BB gun looked something like this. This was his uh this was his BB gun, his belt belt gun. Now, I know we have some parents in this audience, and you're sitting there thinking, oh, thinking, we don't do that in our home. Oh, we're more sophisticated than that. And you're what's wrong with North America. See, my parents really believed that the best way to make a kid mind was to approach him from behind. And we're not talking about child abuse, but we're talking about a good old and they would, all, they would often do that sometimes with a belt, sometimes with a switch, sometimes with their bare hands. And I don't know, maybe that's what the kid of Luke 15 needed. Maybe he just needed a kick in the seat. But he knew he could not stay at home and live like he was going to live. He was going to break his mom and dad's heart. So he says, hey, I'm out of here. He runs away from home. 
And notice what he does in that far country. Verse 13, last part of the verse. There he wasted his substance with riotous, wild, extravagant, sinful living. You say, Keith, what did he do in that far country? Did he, uh, did he drink? Was alcohol involved? Maybe. What about, uh, what about sexual immorality? Did he sleep around? Perhaps. What about pride? Was he proud in that far? Maybe. But in that far country, he sinned. And let me be very, very serious with you folks. That's what sin will do. Are you listening? Sin will drive you into a far country. Sin will separate you from God, from your family, from the church. Didn't Isaiah say in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, your iniquities, your sins have separated between you and your God. We call him a prodigal son, a sinful son. Why? Number one, selfishness. Hey, Papa, take care of me. Uh, here I am. Don't forget about me. Give me what's coming to me. And selfishness led to sin. Missing the mark. Something against God. In that far country, he spends all of his wealth on wild, extravagant, sinful living. But I see something else here, and let me share it with you. I see this word. I see the word starved. Starved. Let me show you how starved, how hungry he is. Go down to verse 14. When he had spent all there, arose a mighty famine of that land. He began to be in want. And so he goes and he joins himself to a person, a citizen of that country. And this guy sends him into his fields to feed pigs, swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did it. And ladies and gentlemen, do you see how starved he is? He's so hungry he could eat pig food. He's so, he's so starved he could eat the slot. I, I am curious. I, I like to know my audiences. So let me just ask you, is there anybody in this audience who's ever slopped the hogs? Anybody slopped the hogs? You are kidding me. Are you serious, all of you? Man, this is Alabama, isn't it? I thought I was preaching in California. All of you, you, you slopped. I grew up in the state of Alabama. I grew up in the country, in the state of Alabama. We, we had a dog, we had a horse, we had, we had uh, uh, you know, animals, but we didn't have any pigs. And, and, and to be honest with you, I've never slopped the hogs in my life. But I have a good imagination. I imagine I'd have to be awfully hungry to eat slop. You know, the, I tell you, the ice cream social a few minutes ago, that was wonderful. Thank you, ladies. Ice cream. I had a pineapple. What was it? Pine, it was what, whoever made that. That was wonderful. Little little ice cream. Yeah, boy, it was. Good. I had some chocolate. Got a little candy on that. Chocolate, sir. It was. We had an ice cream fellowship. Can you imagine a slop fellowship? Imagine the announcement this afternoon at four o'clock here at the church building. We're going to have a slop fellowship. Slop. Now. Here's what I believe Jesus wants us to see in Luke 15. Folks, if we start with this, this leads to this, and this leads to this. Is that right or wrong? If we start with selfishness, I'm on the throne, got to have it my way, my way, the highway, I'm always right, give me what's coming to me. Selfishness leads to Missing the mark, breaking the heart of God. Selfishness leads to sin. And sin leads to starvation. Spiritual, emotional, financial, and even sometimes physical starvation. Are you starved? You say, Keith, man, I, I, I've had plenty to eat today. I'm not asking, are you starved physically? Are you starved for a compliment? A pat on the back? A hug, maybe a non-sexual hug. Maybe you're starved for a better relationship with your husband, your wife. You feel empty at home because things are not going well, going right. Do you feel your hunger? Hey, folks, tonight's lesson is for you. It's for you. 
uh, we need to bring this kid home. He did not stay in that pig pen. He came home. So let's bring him home. I want you to go down to Luke chapter 15 and notice with me verse 17. Verse 17. Think about it. He's in that pig pen. He's surrounded by pigs. They're rooting and rolling and wallowing and feeding and whatever else pigs do. And he comes to himself. And here's what he says. Hmm. How many hired servants of my father's have enough bread and even to share the spare? And I'm dying with hunger. Miles away from his father. Miles away from home. He's in that pig pen. And all of a sudden, it occurs to him, huh? He thinks about his daddy. My father, he says, my, my father was good to the servants. He was good to us kids, but he was good to the servants, to the slaves, to the box boys, to the bus boys, to the foot washers. He was good to us son, but he was even good to the servants, and he remembered the goodness of his father. I want to say something to the baptized believers in this audience, Christians. You have a good father. You say, Keith, a good father. My father abused me when I was a kid. I'm not talking about your father. You say, my daddy ran off with another woman, left mom to struggle with us children. I'm not talking about your daddy. I'm talking about your father. You have a good father. And may I tell you how good your father is? When this occurred to me many, many years ago, it literally changed my life. It changed my life. I went from a burden Christian to a blessed Christian. I went from a guilt-ridden kind of Christian to an at peace kind of Christian. It's a very simple thought, but it literally changed my life. And the thought that changed my life is this. My father, your father, our father is so good. He wants us to be saved even more than we want ourselves to be saved. Let, let me say it like this. Your father is so good, he wants you to go to heaven even more than you want yourself to go to heaven. You want to go to heaven? You just missed a wonderful time to say amen. So I'll give you another shot. You want to go to heaven? You say, go to heaven more than life. Sure, I want to go to heaven. Let me tell you something, folks. No matter how strong your desire is to go to heaven, no matter how fired up you become, you can attend every church service there is to attend, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Uh, you can get down on your knees and pray 17 times every day. You can read and study the Bible every day. You can get out here and knock on doors in the name of Jesus. But no matter how fired up you become, no matter how strong your desire is to go to heaven, there's a God in heaven who loves you. He's crazy about you, and He wants you to be saved even more than you want yourself to be saved. And that's the goodness of God, and that's gospel, good news, preaching the goodness of God. Let me ask the daddies of this audience, daddies, think about it. Do you want your own children to go to heaven? I have, I have three kids. I have my special son, Pete, that I've talked a little bit more about in just a few minutes. I have my son, Pete. I have two daughters. I have six grandbabies. Three children, six grandchildren. You think I, as a father, you think I, as a daddy, want my own children to go to heaven more than life? Sure, I want my kids to go to heaven. But you know, if I want that for my kids, don't you know that the Heavenly Father wants that for His kids? See, God is not against you. He really isn't against you. He's for you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? Romans 8 and verse 31. We call him a prodigal son, a sinful son, a rebellious son. Because number one, he goes to his daddy like this. Hey, Papa, take care of me. Selfishness led to missing the mark. Sin. Sin led to starvation. And here he is in that far country. And what does he do? He thinks about the goodness of his daddy. Huh. My father was good even to the servants. He says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up. And I'm going to go home. And I'm going to say, Daddy, I 
hard to say, isn't it? Isn't it hard to say? In my judgment, the hardest word in the human language is the word no. It's hard for me to say no. Somebody calls me and says, hey, Keith, could you come and preach? Sure, when? I'll be there. I'll be glad to be there. It's hard for me to say no to, a, to an invitation to preach. It's hard for me to say no to the second piece of pie. Now, if I can say no to the first piece, I can say no to the second piece. But it's hard to say no to that first piece of pie, especially if it's chocolate. Or pecan. Or a coconut. I love pie. And it's hard to say no to that dessert, right? Hardest word in the human language is the word no. You know what the two hardest words are? Two hardest words. I'm sorry. Maria, I'm sorry. Dudley, I'm sorry. Hey, Wayne, I'm sorry. You know why it's hard for me to say I'm sorry? Because when I say I'm sorry, I'm not blaming you. I'm not pointing fingers at you. I'm pointing fingers right here. Hardest word, no. Two hardest words, I'm sorry. You know what the three hardest words are? They're found in Luke 15. Did you notice? Three hardest words, Luke 15 and verse 18. I will get up, I will go, and I will say, Daddy. Three hardest words. I have sinned. Now, if you don't believe their heart, let me ask you, when was the last time you said that to anybody? When was the last time you came down a church aisle and said to your church family, I have sinned? Biblical. James 5, 16, confess your sins one to another, right? Pray for one another. 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we do that, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us. So think about it. This year in 2022, have you come forward in church and said, pray for me? Did you do it last year? Two years ago? You've been a Christian how long? 20 years? 25 years? In, in, in 25 years, 25 years as a Christian, have you said to anybody, your husband, your wife, your, your children, your church family, I have seen. Let me plant this thought. We had a tremendous response this morning. Some of you were here. You've been thinking about it this afternoon. And you've been thinking, you know, that should have been, man, I should have been open. I should have been honest. I should have been transparent. I should have gone forward. Let me plant this seed, okay? When we sing that great invitation song, and I didn't know the brother was going to lead this song, we're, we're going to be singing, God is calling the prodigal. And when we sing in just a few minutes, God is calling the prodigal. Why don't you make up your mind right now? I'm going to do what's very, very hard. I'm going to go and I'm going to say, Church, pray for me. I have sinned. That's what the kid does. And so notice what he does in verse 20. Luke 15 and verse 20 it may be my favorite verse in all the Bible. He arose and he came to his daddy. You know how we would say it? He responded. Uh, he walked down a church aisle. He, he went forward. That's how we say it. He went forward. He said, I, I'm going to go. And I, I'm going to do this. And, and he does it. He arose and he went. And I love this part. Don't miss it. When he was yet a great way off, his daddy saw him and had compassion. Don't miss it. And ran. When was the last time you saw your daddy run? The daddy ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And brothers and sisters, that tells me something about God. You know what that tells me about God? That tells me that our God in heaven will run. See, if you step out of one of these aisles tonight and you come forward and you say, you know, I'm not a Christian, I'm not a son of God, but I know what the Bible teaches in Galatians 3, 26 and 27. We're all the children of God by faith. For as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And tonight, I, I, I want to put on Christ. I, I want to be baptized. See, if you come tonight saying, I, I, I need to become a Christian, let me tell you, God will not walk to meet you. He won't walk. He'll run. And if you come tonight saying, you know, I, I'm a child of God. I, I belong to God. I, I was baptized 20 years ago, and, and I just want to live better, and I want to do better. I, I need the church praying for me. If you come tonight saying, pray for me, let me tell you, folks, God won't walk to meet you. He won't walk. He'll run. 
Will God run? Will the God of heaven run? Well, that's what Luke 15 is all about. Luke 15 is really not the story of the sinful son. It's the story of the fantastic father. The father full of grace and mercy and compassion and love. Will run. I've told you about this kid. Let me tell you about my kid. My son is Jeremy. That's his real name. Jeremy Allen Parker. June the 26th, 1982 was the day that he was born. Our firstborn came into the world. June the 26th, 1982. And as I look back on that day, that was the saddest day of my life. Because our son was born with what the doctors called an encephalocele, a sack outside of his head. And there was brain tissue in this sack. We had no idea that anything was going to be wrong until he was born. We were expecting a very normal, healthy little baby. You know, 40 years ago, they did not do all the tests that they do now. And so we were expecting a very normal, healthy little baby. We didn't know if it was going to be a girl or a boy, but when he was born, he was born with that massive sack. We don't know what caused it. Sandra, my wife, believes that she may have had a light case of German measles when she was pregnant. We're not, we're not sure about that. But, but he was born with that massive sack outside of his head. The doctors looked at him, and, and they said, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Parker, there's nothing we can do. They said if we surgically remove that sack outside of his head, more than likely he'll, he'll die in surgery. If he does not die, he'll just, uh, he'll just see us. So we recommend that you take him home and love him. Our hands are tied. There's nothing we can do. That's what we did. We brought him home. We loved him. He did not die. The first few days and weeks of his life, we woke up thinking, you know, maybe this is the day that he's going to die. He did not die. And so when he was about uh, six weeks old, we called some other doctors, and that encephalocele, that sack outside of his head, was surgically removed. And today, physically, he's as healthy as anybody in this room. He's 39 years old. He very seldom gets sick. His diet, uh, McDonald's cheeseburgers, hot dogs, Cookies. That's about what he eats. Hot dogs, cheeseburgers, and cookies. And he stays healthy. 39 years old. But he's never been able to take, take a step by himself in his life. He says very few words that you would understand. We have our own communication. We kind of nicknamed him when he was about 8, 9, 10 years old to eat. A friend came along, picked him up, knew his name. But what's your name? Is your name? Went through a number of names. Is your name Pete? And for some reason, Jeremy did his head like this, and from that day forward, everybody knows him as Spider-Man, Pete Parker, that's his name. 39 years old, never taken a step by himself in his life. Says very few words. He's handicapped. He's brain damaged. I, I, I pour out my soul to you folks. I, I'll just bear my, my, my soul with you. I, I don't like handicapped. I don't like brain damage. I don't like it. But there's something that's worse than brain damage. You know what's worse than brain damage? It's soul. Soul. S-O-U-L. Soul damage. And I'm not God, and I'm not your judge, but maybe we have a few people in this audience, and your soul is damaged before the God of heaven. And we love you. God loves you. This church loves you. And we want you, to, if you need to make some changes in your life, we want you to change. Surrender. Turn around. Make up your mind. I, I, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to say, Father, I have sinned. So what's going to happen tonight? It's a great song. God is calling the prodigal. It's a great song. Would you come home tonight as a prodigal? Would you come tonight? Would you come tonight saying, I just need to become a Christian? Would you come? The water's ready. The clothes are ready. You can be baptized tonight. Will God run? Will the God of heaven run? Oh, you take the first step. Out into one of these aisles, down to the front. And God will not walk to meet you. He won't walk. The God of grace and mercy and compassion and love. That God will 
run. Let's stand and you come. Would you come right now?